So it's now time to introduce the three speakers. So um, we've got extra bonus this time because we normally have two speakers, uh, but this time we've got three. So um, we're going to be particularly strict with them with time. <laughs> we've told them that already. So we have, um, first we have Eve Mulholland, um, who's the engagement officer for the Dynamic Dunescapes in Cumbria, and she works for Cumbria Wildlife Trust. So Eve specializes in linking coastal communities with a natural environment. Um, she's particularly interested in specialist dune species and sustainable dune management, um, but also ensuring local people are at the heart of any project. So um, she's going to talk first. We'll then have Colin Bartholomew, who has already been on the chat, so he's multitasking well. He's the site manager at RSPB Scotland Merced Nature Reserve. Um, so welcome, Colin. And then finally, we'll have Chris Spencer, who is the deputy manager of the Solway Coast Area of Outstanding Attributed Teams, who works in my team. Um, Chris, um, some of you will know, he's been leading on a nature recovery project in Marlborough Banks Nature Reserve and um, working to improve the health of the dune habitat. Um, and he loves the diversity of the Solway Coast landscape and heritage, which I think we probably all do, actually. So we're going to start with Eve first. So we'll switch um, our um, videos off and we'll let Eve um, switch her sound and camera back on and hand over. Here she is. What an excellent cue. <laughs> Welcome, Eve. Hi there, hopefully you can all uh, hear and see me okay. So uh, thanks very much for having me this evening. I'm Eve Mulholland, I'm the Engagement Officer for Dynamic Dunescapes in Cumbria um, and work for, working for Cumbria Wildlife Trust. So I'm just going to talk a bit about the project tonight and why sand dunes are so important. So Dynamic Dunescapes is part of a national project restoring some of the most important sand dune systems and there's many partners involved here and it's funded by National Lottery Heritage Fund and EU Life Programme. So the project's working across many areas, we're working across 34 sites in total, but here up in Cumbria we're working across 11 of those sites and the Cumbria team, led by Cumbria Wildlife Trust with my own role and Natural England who are leading on the conservation works for the project, we're working from the Solway Coast, so up at Marbury Banks and Greenpoint, working very closely with Solway Coast AOND, all the way down Copeland, um, Barrowborough, Walney Island, we're also working at Fleetwood too. And the project, it's all about restoring sand dunes, um, but we're wanting to get people and the communities involved in the project too. So why sand dunes then? Well, sand dunes are actually the habitat most at risk in Europe for biodiversity loss. They're very much at threat from habitat loss and habitat fragmentation. And to put this in perspective, since the 1900s, Wales has lost 60% of this habitat and only 20,000 hectares remain across England and Wales. So it's, it's very much declining habitat. But sand dunes are home to many different specialised wildlife plants and animals um, that rely on these sand dunes system so they've been identified as a priority habitat and this is because they are at risk because sand dunes become overgrown with vegetation and have almost stabilised so the way in which we manage sand dunes now have, has, has changed slightly so the project's all about implementing these new conservation techniques to support the biodiversity that lives there. So sand dunes, our, our coastlines, they're, they're very changeable in bat environments and some areas are at the forefront of the weather systems facing erosion. In other areas, shingle spits are starting to form and the circulation of sands, meaning new sand dunes are starting to grow and develop. And there's many different habitat types within a sand dune system and in a healthy sand dune, there's a range of habitat types, meaning there's a wide uh, range of biodiversity. So dune begins life as embryo dunes, so sand accumulates, pioneer species start to grow. These are very sandy, open, changing habitat types. And within dune siftings, you also have fixed dunes as well. So more nutrients are input into the ground. So lots of mosses, lichens, fungi, uh, even dune heath and dune grassland containing a wide variety of wildflowers can grow too. And these fixed dunes tend to have less areas of bare sand within them. And you also have dune slacks within their sand dune systems as well, and these are depressions within the dune systems caused by erosion, meaning the closer to the water table. So these often hold pools which are ephemeral, and these are important for invertebrates, very specialist orchids and plant species, but also the home of the natajack toad too, where they use these pools for breeding. And you also have later successional stages where you might find some areas of scrubland or woodland too. 
But the thing that dunes face is dune stabilization and it's these latter successional stages which have almost exploded and kind of outcompeted these earlier dune successional stages. So these maps here, this shows sand scale horse so down, down the course from the Sillip, um, this nature reserve, these red patches show the areas of bare sand. So as you can see in 1946, about 40% of this dune system was covered in bare sand compared to today when less than 2% of this dune system is covered in bare sand. So there's a stark difference there and this we've, we're seeing this all, all around the country. This is not just at this site, this is a trend that we're seeing in quite a lot of places. And there's a variety of reasons that are leading to this kind of loss of sandy open habitat and this overgrowth of vegetation. So dunes have been historically used for grazing cattle, grazing sheep, but also rabbit warrens too. And rabbits are kind of the main grazies of dunes. Um, they'll burrow um, open up bare sat patches of sand and they're alongside the cattle and sheep as well. They'll graze to keep that scrub at bay. But recently we've seen loss of rabbit populations due to fluctuations by myxomatosis, which is a man-made introduced disease and to control rabbit populations. We've also seen increase in atmospheric nitrogen deposition and um, putting nutrients into the ground and climate change too so um, reduction in wind speeds increase rain accelerating that vegetation growth as well as changes in how the land has been used and how we've historically managed dunes as well this is this is a map just showing kind of the um the as you can see sandscale horse was once a rabbit warren as well in the 1850s and here we've got Esmeal's dunes. So this is an image taken in 1970, which shows just how open and sandy this habitat once was. And another example of Esmeal's dunes here, as you can see, there's lots of open sand, lots of shingle, shingle, a very kind of changing and dynamic system. So it's very different to now what we see today because of this variety of different factors. So why, why is this an issue then? Well, many of the important species that live on our dunes rely on this open space habitat to thrive, one of which is the natterjack toad, which I'm going to leave to Colin and Chris to talk about a bit more later on. But another is the northern dune tiger beetle, and this is one of my favourite species on, on the dunes. It's possibly one of the fastest beetles in the world. And it's only found on Drig dunes um, in the centre of Cumbrian coastline and on Sefton coast too, and it's highly adapted to live on these mobile dune habitats um, because it burrows in the sand to lay its eggs and um, it needs certain temperatures to be able to regulate its body um, and and uh, the larva will develop within these burrows and uh, they'll overwinter there too. So it's highly adapted for this particular environment and it'll also hide amongst the marron grass as well if it's too warm to keep itself cool and it will only only live in these embryo habitats. We've also got a variety of different plant species as well. And the dune helleborine, this is a nationally scarce species and the only known record of it is that sandscale haws. Um, we've got the yellow bird's nest, this is a red listed species. Um, this plant actually contains no chlorophyll, so it has um, like a mycorrhizal relationship, so it gains its nutrients um, from, from this um, relationship there. And finally, on, on the right hand side, that, that nice pretty yellow flower. Um, this is the Isle of Man cabbage and this is recorded up on the Solway coast, coastal area up there, and, but it's now only found in about 22 localities and the reason for this decline is still yet unknown but it could be related to the like habitat fragmentation of dunes for instance and you can find this species growing in kind of the open mobile dune environment. And going on to the, Sil the Silith coastline, we're very lucky to have an area of dune heath and this is a habitat becoming ever, ever rare in Cumbria. And this dune heath in particular is home to a wide variety of invertebrates and in particular bees. And one of those bee species is the, the heather mining bee and what it will do, it will collect pollen specifically from the bell heather. And its flight season kind of coincides with when these flowers emerge. And it's a solitary bee, so it also burrows in the ground around the dune heathland too. We also find the heath bumblebee, and this is also associated with dune heath, but dune heath on the upland areas as well. But it's not only restricted to dune heath, so it's a little bit more widespread. 
The Marlborough Banks and Groom Point and the whole still of coastline is home to a wide variety of bird species too. So you've got your ground nesting birds such as your skylarks, your stone chats and linnets, which you can find around the dune system. You might be lucky enough to spot your migratory birds as well, such as your arctic terns or little terns. And the shingle, the shingle banks around the dune systems are also a habitat for nesting birds as well, such as the ring plover, which has been recorded nesting in the area. So there's a whole host of species that rely on this dune habitat type. So dynamic dunescapes, it's all about implementing and helping the dune systems to get them dynamic and moving again, and to help create a wide variety of different habitat types for all of these species to thrive. So there's a range of works that will be happening as part of the project and Chris and Colin I'm sure are going to be telling us more about what's happening on the dunes um, but this might range from opening up areas of bare sand on dune grassland to restoring and creating new pools and dune slats to the introduction of grazing um, to help keep that dune grassland habitat healthy. And the project overall is aiming to restore 7,000 hectares of air sand dune systems across the 34 sites in total, ensuring 35% of these are in favourable condition and at least half of the important rare and protected species are supported through piloting and sharing best practice. But as, as I mentioned earlier, it's not only about the dune restoration itself, it's about getting people involved. So one of the things that we're doing up at Marbury Banks, working with Chris at Solway Coastway A and B, is introducing a citizen science scheme. And this is a part of a long-term national pioneering scheme to monitor and understand our sand dunes, to understand exactly how these conservation works are and the effects that they are having on the sand dune systems there to in future uh, ensure about the future sustainability and the management of our dunes. So we will be looking for volunteers to get involved and to train them up and um, to get involved in the project there. And you can find out more on the Cumbria Wildlife Trust website. And with the exciting news of the potential easing restrictions, well, we're hoping to be running events on the dunes. And this is about kind of informing on the wide variety of wildlife, getting people outside and excited about the wonderful environment that they've got on their doorstep. So you can find out more on our Dynamic Dunescapes website and on the Cumbria Wildlife Trust website too. So I'm going to um, unshare my screen now and hand over to Colin, who's going to take us on to the other side of the Firth, I believe, um, to explore his sand dune area there. Hello everyone, so I'm just going to... Hello, can everyone hear me? Um, yeah, welcome. Thank you for inviting me to launch this tonight. Uh, my name's Colin Bartholomew. I'm the site manager for RSPB Mershead Nature Reserve. And just going to briefly talk to you about um, what we want to do with the dune systems at Mershead. It's a relatively untouched habitat for us for the last 20 odd years since we've owned the site. And there's many reasons for that, as I'll go into as uh, um, we go through the talk. Um, so, just find my... Okay, so the reserve. Mershead itself is uh, approximately um, 1,200 hectares in, in, in area. Over 700 hectares of that actually reaches out into the Solworth itself, uh, which we lease off the uh, Crown Estate. Uh, the physical area of land is more about 400 hectares that we manage. Now, it comprises of, um, like I said, intertidal going out into the Mers. Um, over 20 hectares of dunes and um, dune grasslands and 400 odd hectares of wetlands, dry grassland and a very small area of woodlands and within that wetlands is a very small reed bed as well. Um, the reserve uh, lies in the upper um, Solway Flats and Marshes Triple SI, SPA, Ram, it's a part Ramsar site and is part of the East Territory National Scenic Area so it's pretty well um, sort of cited um, um, on an important site. 
I'm going to put you onto another slide here now. This is this is quite important, and it'll explain why we haven't really dealt with the dune system for quite a while. In 2017, we had the opportunity to acquire new land. So the pink areas are uh, Mare's Head and West Preston, and the purple areas, in particular, uh, Preston Mare's joins our reserve up. So we joined the jigsaw up to allow us to manage the whole site a lot better. And it's given us an opportunity to start really thinking about what we want to do in the dunes. So um, I will continue. And just to give you some concept, concept really of the area. So we are looking, this aerial photograph is looking, um, if you look to the bottom of the picture, that's to the uh, west of the site and then going up to the top of the picture to the little spit, which is Southern S, is the absolute uh, point of, 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 of the reserve and it captures Mershead, Preston Mers, and West Preston, and you can see along the edge of the picture there the dune, the dune systems that we, we, we want to we want to manage. Um, and to give you more concept, this is looking down um, on part of the reserve. Now, one of the things about the reserve is we are managing for uh, important species of geese, which is the Svalbard barnacle geese, coming come down every year um, and winter. Uh, in the Solway, on the Solway coast. They like to winter very close uh, to, to the coastline, but for um, we manage the reserve primarily to provide habitat for these geese as they winter here before, before they return back to the Arctic Circle in the spring. Um, there's a subpopulation of some 43,000 of these birds. It's been an amazing um, uh, conservation recovery. Just after the Second World War, there was only four, 450 of these birds left in the world. And now there's over 43,000. Mershead's very lucky to, and West Preston's very lucky to accommodate roughly about a third of that population as they spread all, all, all the way along the, on the, along the coastline. Part of that comes of actually we manage for geese. And you can see by this aerial picture, there is a squeeze. You can see where, where we do crop rotations to keep the, the soils nice and fertile, but we're pushing way up to the sand dunes, as you can see by this photograph. I also want to talk a little bit about the history. Now, the history of the site, um, we're gonna go back several thousand years, if not more. Um, this is looking west towards Sandy Hills, and you can see in the background there, there's little farmsteads. And even though Mare's Head is, is quite flat, you will start to realize that over, over millennia, um, we realized that actually the reserve has got various pockets of flattened, manicured sand fossilized sand dunes and they go further beyond this and the big big yellow bit at the far end is where all the farmsteads and everything built so these farmsteads were built in the 1700s so they knew what they were doing they never flood and at the far point is where the dune systems are, are reaching the, um, the, the the coast we know from old marine maps as well um, that the, the dune systems and the land actually went further out into the into the Solway at this point of the reserve. So again, looking west towards Sandy Hills, this is the um, the dune systems here are very vulnerable to uh, erosion. Um, and have been for many, many years. Um, various parts of this sandy beach that you're looking at at one point was farmland. It's slowly been eroded um, and uh, suffers from dreadful, uh, uh, dreadful sort of coastal events, as you can see. And th the next picture I'm gonna show you is the same sand dune, but looking east this time. So this was a result of tidal storm surges, surges in 2013 stroke 14 winter and it completely obliterated the dunes. I'm pleased to say, you know, after even going back six years, seven years ago, that those dune systems are now built up again. So there's, a, there's an awful lot of accretion and erosion going on. So it's quite a dynamic um, a part, of the, a, a part of the reserve, which is quite important. We'll, we'll touch on that a bit later as well. And this is just to give you a scope of what it was like in 2000, winter 2014. This is my colleague's digger, the blank didn't work. And basically the sea was, the photograph doesn't do it justice, but we were surrounded by the sea there in a major, a major storm, a storm surge, which affected our dune systems. 
So I'm going to go back a little bit closer to, to in history. Um, um, ironically, I've got a picture from taken from 1946 as well. Uh, and this this aerial photograph you can see is of West uh, Preston Mers and West Preston, taken by the RAF uh, in 1946. And you can see here, if you look at the grey, uh, the very light grey areas where the red circle is, the dune systems have actually just gone straight inland, whether there's been a major blowout or they just won't be managed for, uh, for a while. And if you look at the map next to it, you'll see there's two long or two linear marked down as drains within this field where I put the red circle on the aerial. And that is actually uh, the remains of dune slacks were the farming that was carried on after the, the, after the RAF had finished working there, they actually man, manufactured the land, they cultivated this out and the other. And obviously these slacks were probably too deep, taking in too much water, they left them. And they're now marked down an OS map as just drinks, but they are part of an old dune slack that, that, that has been farmed into, into these linear, into these linear uh, shapes. And just to give you, there's a little red block here, that I've, a little red square on the aerial. Um, the RAF used this, and, and most of the Solway coastline uh, on both sides, I believe, but um, we have uh, various um, um, target things out at Sandy Hills that are remnants of the RAF flying down the Solway and, 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 and using flares as target practice. It was um, um, a part of a training thing. And this is where uh, one of the, the lookout towers was placed. Now, um, and it looks straight across the Solway. Now, if we go to the next slide, I want to give an example of what it looks like now. So I haven't, if you look at the top picture, you'll see I've circled and put an arrow. This is where the block is. Now, when you go and visit that, the first time I ever visited that when we bought this chunk area of land was how did they see over the dunes? So from 1946 till present day, if you look at the area I'm showing you now, you can see the ridges of the dune line and it's really high and you can't see across it. So in a very, very fast, uh, well, an extremely fast period of time, which because most sand dunes you'd expect to take quite a while to mature and roll and, and, and actually keep rolling back. Um, but there's actually the accretion has been quite fast in this area. Just to give you an example of how dynamic these, the, the sand dunes at Mers Head are. So I'm going to go on a little bit about the, um, um, the habitats as well. Uh, Eve mentioned various different um, um, plants and I want to talk really about, you know, it's, it's almost a reserve of two halves. So we're looking at the, uh, the western part of Mers Head. Um, where the erosion is and there's actually more pioneering sort of um, sort of spits and sand and and some of the dunes have been washed away and this is where we get the most sort of you know species rich um, sort of flora uh, um, in here so island man cabbage for example we have you know sheep with scabious you know and, 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 and wild pansies and a whole range of various invertebrates as well uh, which he touched on as well um, and various ground nesting birds like little ring plovers and everything. But as we go further west, we start to see there's, um, you know, the, 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 there's tall species and rank vegetation. And these are the sort of habitats we want. These are the sort of habitats we've got on the eastern part of the reserve. Here you can see sheep with scab scabious. In the background, there's some, uh, there is some, um, um, some of the, the island white mountain cabbage and again these areas have been grazed predominantly by rabbits, hares um, um, and maybe a bit of scuffling by man and dogs and stuff like that but this, it's bare sand it provides a fantastic habitat for these, for this, for these species. So I'm going to go on to really how and what do we want to do for the future. So we're looking further to the west, to the east of the site where I mentioned there was uh, more rank grasslands. Um, we're quite quite the middle in the bit in the middle. In, remember the bit on the purple, bit of the purple on the map previously, Preston Mers. Um, the aerial showing the tar block is is it, the what we inherited was they had fenced off a wide area, which has given us fantastic opportunity, which hasn't been touched for years, but it's it's allowing the dunes to roll. 
and in the aerial I showed before where we're, we're doing all the crop roads, uh, crop management, um, you'll see this turquoise hash area. What we're now looking at is to refence and allow the dunes to start thinking about rolling over naturally rather than farming right up to the edge. And similarly uh, on West Preston, where you see these two, these two linear ditches, is to break down the fencing and slowly allow the dunes to, um, uh, to naturally roll. It could take years to do this. Um, it's a good thing to have more dynamic systems to introduce it to. Uh, managing um, some of the, um, the farming aspect of, of the reserve is, is not sustainable. Uh, we are pumping a lot of, you know, you know fertilizers and chemical into into soils which cannot produce the goods anymore so it's about you know reintroducing and letting the dunes start to roll um, um and more naturally and this gives you an idea looking from that area i was telling you about where it's it's all rank this is looking down uh, along the beach and onto the coast and the dunes are probably being stabilized somewhat really because we've got a lot of vegetation growing on the tidal, it, 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 the intertidal, more pioneering species, potentially species we don't want like Spartania, uh, cord grass, but we need, that's something we need to look at. Um, but the long-term goal is to do something similar, have a big open areas, less wards, make it more botanically rich um, and more richer for um, um, for invertebrates such as uh, belted beauty is one we'd love to have here which is really quite a rare moth um, but it's not just about um, um, just the, you know the birds and the bees and the flowers it's also we are doing and looking to improve the habitat for natterjack toad um, just to give you a history of this um, Natterjack toads were introduced to Mershead in 1999 um, and um, from Southern S, uh, which is just about six miles up the road. It's on that spit, which I showed you on the aerial earlier. And they were then held in an area on the, if you look at the blue dot to the immediate right, if you're looking at the left, left as you're looking at the picture, they were held in four pools. In, within that area for several times and, ma and, and managed very, very um, um, wrong, I thought for, for want of a better word. Um, in 2013-14, we had this massive tidal surge. It washed through. You can see where it's blowing out on the aerial. And the saltwater incursion actually did us a favour um, because it wiped out all the invertebrates or you know the, the aquatic invertebrates within the, within the freshwater ditch systems behind that which were a major predator for the natterjack toads subsequently that summer in 2014 we had a turnout of, of over 300 we identified over 300 singing male toads and one of the interesting things of this project that we did for two years was looking and trying to uh, mark and recapture so to speak so um, Natterjack toads have got a fingerprint and it's called the dorsal warts and by taking a photograph directly down on top of the door on top of the on top of the toad you can start to build up a picture um, and identify them if you recapture them again and that was quite successful for us over the, of, over two years uh, the other blue dots in the sort of shows you the slow distribution of how they are moving around the site once we released them from their artificial pools and we've done that and we still do work uh, on certain uh, on certain areas of, of, of the site but we want to do more and there's various reasons we want to do more more um one of them is uh, I'll, I'll quickly touch on it um is climate change um and climate change this map or this aerial sort of shows you a very rough sort of projection of what the eastern end or the western end of Mershead could look like from 2030 onwards and you can see the green area down here this is where all the houses and the farmsteads are so even way back in the 1700s they knew how to future proof uh, but potentially we could start losing some of these habitats so we want to push them further to the east we also want the natural jacks to spread out further in a more natural system so in 2017, the members of the RSPB and members of the public kindly donated to help us buy this middle chunk of land called Preston Mares. Um, 
And part of that money uh, helped us to start thinking, what are we going to do there? So the first steps was to go in and actually start stripping out scrub. The, the site uh, or the, the, the part of the dune systems was um, classified as um, uh, unfavorable declining under uh, SNH or natural scot as they're now known. Uh, and part of our work was to help them get that back into a more favorable condition. So I think the designation has changed from decline into favorable condition. Um, the first thing we did, we went in. Uh, our predecessors who owned this chunk of land had um, cunningly hid loads of rubbish in the dunes. So one of the first things we did was try and get to move that. And then we carried on, cracked on uh, and started uh, removing scrub across a, a, a six or over eight hectare area. So I'm pleased to say that's been done. So long term, um, the next stage is what we want to do is you want to graze those dunes. Uh, they have not been grazed in in the time I've been there, and I don't think since, since the time the RSPB have owned the site, which is in way back in 1993. Um, this is not from Air said, this is a picture I, I took and got captured from somewhere else. But the idea is to start thinking about getting animals onto the site to, to graze, to get into the dune slacks, uh, into the shallow areas, create the right sward for natterjacks to move on. Also, bits of poaching, burr bits of sand be created and also keep on top of the scrub that we removed. We just knocked back successional scrub by 50 years. So we want to, we want to carry on with that. Um, so the next stage we're working on is um, working with the EU LIFE project, 100% favourable condition uh, project within Scotland. Uh, we submitted a project to think about doing some invisible fencing. Uh, the initial project thing, I, I, the concept I put through was to do fencing with a, uh, a loop buried into the dunes with these huge collars um, that would help um, give, the, give the cattle a bit of a shock when they came close to the loop. Uh, thankfully, uh, technology has superseded that idea because it doesn't really work and it's quite expensive. And it's also, I suppose, in terms of public relations, it looks a bit weird and, you know, people are concerned about animals getting an electric shock. But we use electric fencing in, in a normal traditional electric fencing in other circumstances. This is a new system and it's called No Fence and it's designed by a Norwegian company. Um, the idea is they have a little collar you can see on the bottom there, they have little blue collars, they're, 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 they're quite, um, they don't get bogged down in brash and scrub and everything. And what it does is you use a phone, it's a smartphone, you produce a map um, and that's downloaded onto the, onto the cattle collars. And then when a cattle gets close to the boundary that we've created through GPS, it'll give off a warning sign. And it'll just warn the animals who are getting close and eventually one will get an electric shop but the idea is that eventually they get used to that and they stay within their areas uh we're at a stage where we're now negotiating with a new, a new grazier who's really into this sort of concept and we're really looking forward to how we take that forward if you're interested in any examples of how this works so i have put a hyperlink up here and it's um it's uh, a PDF uh, docu a doc document uh, produced by the RSPB at Gelsdale Reserves uh, about how they're managing to do this uh, on their site. And it's working very well. And it's starting to take off with other, other organizations as well. So that is a really, really brief, rapid, <laughs> um, sort of what we want to do at Merced. Um, I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to hand over to uh, Chris. Hi folks, uh, my name's Chris Spencer um, and uh, I'm a Deputy Manager at uh, the Solway Coast AOMB um, but also leading on uh, our project on, on Marlborough Banks and, and the dunes um, uh, on the Solway Coast more, more widely. Um, so our project is um, 
as he said, is, is part of the Dynamic Dreamscapes project. Um, it's uh, we've, we've been sort of engaged in a, a nature recovery project in the dunes for uh, the last uh, uh, three or four years, um, and uh, Dynamic Dreamscapes uh, has allowed us to, to to move forward in that project and, and widen its scope. Um, so we've been active over the last uh, couple of years, putting in new Natajack pools, um, and also. Uh, doing some scrub clearance. Um, Dynamic Dunescapes has allowed us to get on top of uh, some of the Russell Rugosa, Japanese rose uh, invasive species problems we have along the coast, uh, and also to look at, at grazing um, of the Marlborough, Marlborough dunes as well. Um, so it's quite a quite a diverse project. Um, it's great being part of the Dynamic Dunescapes project. It allows us to, to learn from not only the Cumbrian um, dunes and the work that's going on and approaches and um, techniques uh, but also more widely across the country as well so there's, there's a lot of sharing of knowledge uh, which we've been able to integrate into uh, our work on on, on Marlborough dunes. Just give a bit of context as to where we are um, so the um, uh, Marlborough dunes is roughly halfway between Surlef and Allenby. Uh, it's part of a more extensive dune system um, and in terms of what we manage um, it's sort of from from Woolsey dunes uh, down to down to Allenby um, is, is is largely not, not entirely but largely uh, under under our management. I've been looking at the Marlborough dunes uh, more specifically um, the Dunes is sort of split into two. Actually, there's a, there's a, there's a track running through the middle of the um, reserve here, um, and uh, to the south, this lighter area um, is uh, the area where most of the work we're doing at the moment is on. The area to north here is is actually uh, common land, so that both gives opportunities but also limitations in terms of the management approaches we can we can take on on that area. Um, Hugely popular area, um, very important area. It's Triple S I, um, and um, and is 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 June Heath, um, and so uh, you know sort of huge potential for improvement on the, for, for the habitat for the Natterjacks and also improving the the health of the June Heath. Um, but it's also uh, you know a really important area for for local people and for for uh, public use, uh, and really really valued by both local people and and, and visitors to the area. So just looking at the sort of range of, of, of projects and, and work we've got um, going on, uh, have done and, and looking forward over the next few years. Um, so we started by looking at um, uh, increasing the number of, of Natterjack pools. Um, the site has probably been underperforming in terms of its potential for as, as Natterjack habitat. Um, we had one original pool um, here. Um, Last year we added a further pool up here and then this year we put in two further pools or three pools really because this one is split in two um, and uh, we've uh, been re-engineered this, this original pool as well to, to increase its, its success in terms of in terms of Natterjack um, breeding. Um, we've got quite a lot of scrub, we'll look at it a little bit later um, and also um, this purple area along here was fairly extensive uh, Japanese rose um, growth along this uh, the, the, the raised beach um, along the along the shoreline, um, and also we're installing fencing around the site uh, so we can introduce grazing. So an aerial photograph look um, at the site. So this is the original pool. Uh, this was the pool we put in in 2019 uh, before we put it in. Um, and um, then the two feather pools. Um, you can see this sort of darker areas are heather, that's the June Heath. Um, quite a lot of scrub, again we'll talk about that. Um, and then this is the area in terms of the raised beach um, and the um, sort of embryo to, to fairly fixed dunes along, along this area here. Um, and this area here is looking towards the um, the, the, the common land, section 51 common land, uh, and so the, the site is sort of split by this track running through the middle here. The perspective on, on the dunes, and this gives you quite a good view of, of, of the site. Um, so this is the Marlborough end, um, 
this is the track running through the middle down here um, and uh, we've this, since this photograph, uh, just just uh, over the last last few months, uh, a cycle path has been installed along the edge here, um, and uh, the fencing is going to run around this area here. Um, again, just in terms of perspective, in terms of managing the dunes, there's quite a quite a distinct sort of um, uh, distinction between this area here, which was actually um, was a, a gravel extraction pit. Um, Sort of before the war, um, and and then was used for for some landfill. Um, and uh, those are your local <coughs> um, a lot of wood waste from the what was Thames Board and is now the Higgerson's um, uh, plant in Workington was was tipped in here. So actually, the sort of makeup of this this area um, to the the south of the reserve, um, there is quite a lot of. Um, material in there uh, and so the nutrient balance is quite distinct and uh, doesn't really show up on this photograph but actually as you walk through the dune you can see quite a distinct uh, change in terms of the, the, the amount of brush um, and the sort of health of the dune heath um, at the boundary as to where that landfill uh, occurred in the, the 1950s, 1960s. So to say one of the First projects we were involved in was um, putting new pools in. Um, so uh, this was one of the pools we put in in 2019. Um, increasing the number of, of breeding pools, um, but also increasing the uh, or improving the um, uh, the design of those pools to to, to make them um, uh, successful breeding pools for the natter jacks. Um, we'll see this a little bit later on, but uh, this is a, a new sort of bund we we constructed. This year, with with some of the the material re removed when we were doing turf scraping, uh, and this was to shelter this pool from from the wind. Uh, we were finding a lot of the nashjacks were all being forced down to this end and getting sort of beached. Uh, the the, the um, spawn and the toadlets uh, were getting beached at this end. So actually built a little bit of a windbreak at this at this end. So oh, in terms of the design of the pools, we worked very closely with the Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Trust uh, and again learning from what has worked in, in other sites, both in Cumbria and more nas nationally, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, sort of both the design and the construction specification for the pools. Um, always quite je jealous uh, when people like Colin are talking about, um, uh, you know, sort of natural dune slacks. Um, because of the proximity of a road and also the agricultural drainage, the, um, the, the, the water table on the, the banks uh, is quite depressed. Um, so actually just digging a hole um, doesn't produce a, a dune slack. Um, the, uh, the water table is, is too low. So we have to take a slightly more engineered approach to constructing pools. Um, so we have to use liners. Um, and so this is construction of one of the pools. Uh, using a butyl liner um, and as I said with amphibian and reptile conservation uh, what we actually uh, have is a sandwich of, of liner using um, a combination of geotextile and butyl liner um, so the, the butyl liner is protected um, and then um, on top of that uh, we refill the, the pool with, with with a layer of sand to produce pools of sort of the optimum depth of around about 500 millimeters. Um, so we want pools which are um, will warm up quickly um, and the pools will make use very quickly of uh, that warm water to, to breed. Uh, the warmer the water, the, the quicker the maturation of the of the toads um, and also uh, that will dry out. So these pools um, are ephemeral. They will dry out periodically during the during the summer um, and then refill. Um, and we found using this construction and using this, this, this design, um, we're getting multiple spawnings um, of, of the toads um, and that rapid rapid maturation allows them to to sort of occupy that niche of an ephemeral pool um, but reduces the competition from common toads um, and newts and uh, dragonfly larvae and so on um, which uh, would, would, would outcompete the, the toads. So another view of the construction so we've actually got the liner in uh, and now re refilling uh, the pool with with sand so this layer of sand um, both 
Yeah, uh, for those of you who, who are familiar with the site, um, we did have exposed liners on, on the original pool, um, and um, that obviously caused problems because it got very, very hot um, <laughs> in the sun, um, and uh, we, we were finding we were losing toes as they were emerging from the pool uh, just because of the exposed liner getting to, 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 to fairly, fairly extreme temperatures. Um, so um, the, uh, the, the sand infill both protects the liner um, and even as we introduce cattle to the site um, this layer of 500 mil of sand on top of the liners will protect the, the liner um, from any um, hoof disturbance um, but also produces a, a far more conducive pool for, for the toes, toes breeding. This is nearing completion of, of this pool. And you can see around the edge of the pool, um, we've done a fairly extensive turf scraping uh, around the perimeter of the pools and other areas in the dunes, um, producing bare sand, uh, increasing the sort of dynamism of the, uh, of, of the dune, um, dunes, but also um, the uh, natajacks uh, hibernate by burrowing into um, the dunes. Um, and um, so actually having bare sand allows them to, to do that. Um, they're, they're not not capable of um, you know, sort of moving through through grass to, to be able to burrow. They'll also um, use uh, rabbit rabbit holes, um, abandoned rab rabbit holes to, to, to uh, hibernate in. And uh, this is one of the pools uh, having refilled and another Again, you can see the toe scraping around the edge. So that was the Jet Pools uh, project over a couple of years to, to <clears throat> increase from one to, <coughs> to five pools. Um, the other project which we've been doing this, this earlier this year uh, was um, Russell Rigosa removal or Japanese, Japanese rose removal. Um, Quite an attractive plant for a garden, um, but but quite a thug within um, an environment uh, like the dunes. Um, so this is an area of uh, not actually on Marlborough dunes, um, uh, but another area we're just clearing at the moment down towards Beckfoot. Um, so you can see it's um, it is both quite thuggish and very voracious, um, and um, you know so it expands uh, very rapidly. Um, and uh, this particular stand here is taller than me and I'm about six foot four. Um, so it was um, quite a significant uh, issue. The, the Russerigosa at Marlborough uh, certainly was less tall, um, but was uh, both uh, still very extensive uh, along the raised beach area along the, uh, along the shoreline. So this was this this area is 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 very extensive at, uh, at Beckfoot, um, and certainly this was what we were trying to avoid um, at, at Marlborough. Um, left the Russerigosa will just um, you know sort of take over the entire entire habitat. So the approach we took uh, there are a number of approaches um, for removing Russerigosa. Um, all of them are um, <laughs> both very expensive. Um, and uh, it is, a, as I say, a, a real thug. Um, obviously, it's a rhizome um, a spreading plant, um, so you actually have to uh, get right down to the roots to remove it. Uh, there are some areas at Betfort actually where we have actually dug the roots out um, right down uh, to, to about three or four feet uh, and then remove all the, all the root material. Um, at Marlborough, we use this deep mulching machine. Uh, so on the back of a tractor, it actually um, goes right down to uh, the um, the root system uh, and chops it up um, and then using this technique we will have to come back over the next two to three years um, spot spraying regrowth but by doing this we're actually able to you know the, the plant is much weakened um, and actually able to identify where the where the rhizomes are still sprouting uh, and then treat them over over a number of years uh, to achieve total eradication. So this is an area at Marlborough where, where that deep mulching has, has taken place. Um, it does produce areas of, of bare sand, which is, is a sort of side benefit really, uh, will allow um, you know, sort of emergent um, growth 
here um, and also allow us to spot spot treat uh, any any regrowth. When the, the final challenge at, at Marlborough um, is uh, you know, sort of the, the succession to, to rank grass and, and also brush and, and gorse. Um, and sort of this, this shows you some of the issue. Uh, in, in the time that I've been, been, been working on Marlborough, um, I've seen the rabbit population, um, you know, sort of at times expand, uh, but predominantly um, over, over the last nine or so years that I've, I've, I've been um, uh, on, on Marlborough quite a bit, um, the rapid population has declined fairly significantly. Um, and so we have this, this rank grass, I think it's around about 20, 20 or 30 years since the area has been grazed uh, to, to any extent. Um, so we have this very, very dense um, vegetative load of, uh, of rank grass. Um, and, and really, uh, to a large extent, um, it's, a, it's a bit of a monoculture. Um, and so, to try and remove this this um, this density of, of, of vegetation, um, we're looking for some 24/7 volunteers to to munch their way through it. Um, and so, uh, introducing um, a small herd of of uh, Belted Galloway uh, cattle from a, an established conservation grazing herd. Um, and so, to do that, uh, the first stage is to to to, to fence the site. Um, so that's actually happening now, as we as we well, as we speak. speak but uh, certainly, I've been down there today, and uh, and the fencing is is progressing uh, very well. So uh, a boundary fence all the way around around the site. Um, introducing a new entrance here, which will be sort of the, the, the management entrance and uh, where where uh, the cattle can be can be handled. Um, and uh, Early in this the summer, we will be introducing a herd of initially eight um, belted Galloways, um, and we'll then be uh, monitoring um, uh, the success of the grazing uh, and, and establishing what the uh, what the actual um, optimum grazing regime will be will be for the site. That's me done. I'll hand over the questions. That's great. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. That was uh, really interesting. So um, I'll go on to uh, start some of the questions and see if we can get through a few of them. There's quite a few in at the moment. So the first one is, um, how long is the Dynamic Dunes project running for? Um, and once restoration is achieved, will the dynamic habitats be maintained or will they be left to succession again? So I think probably Eve, you might have to answer that one. Because yeah, that's that's one off. for me. In a, oh. There we are, just getting a bit of feedback there. That's fine. Yeah, perfectly good question. So the, the project's run until 2023. And unfortunately, as with lots of these kinds of projects, it is obviously short term. Um, but in this case, with dynamic dunescapes, because we're working across so many sites, many of those sites are already managed by kind of environmental bodies and organisations. And a big part of this project, as Chris mentioned and Colin mentioned, you know, it's part of like sharing lessons learned. And we're putting together like a large kind of site manager's handbook so be able to like carry on, take forwards that the work that are taking place after after the dynamic dunescape project has ended and about learning and sharing the best methods of practice. Um, and in those areas that might be kind of council owned or owned by other people who don't necessarily do kind of direct conservation work. So we're working closer with the local communities and we are look, looking for like volunteers to kind of get involved and look out for Rosa Ragosa, particularly around Haverig area. And um, we're also teaming up with um, amphibian and reptile conservation. We're advertising at the moment for volunteers to come and get involved to kind of help monitor uh, the vegetation around dune slacks and things like that. Um, so there's a lot, kind of lots of ways about that that we're trying to kind of continue that project forwards. Great, thank you. Uh, we've got a, another question here um, uh, around Marlborough Bank, so it's probably one for Chris, but maybe Eve um, might be able to come into this one. Um, it, it's a longish question, but it's about a question around um, what kind of monitoring um, that you're going to be doing on the site over the seasons, um, taking in certain species just to assess the impact before the cattle go on. 
Um, there's a little bit of concern over uh, wax caps, um, mushrooms there. I think the general question around general vegetation. Um, I don't know who wants to kick off with this one. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, yes, we've, we've, we'll be, um, we've, we've got a, a, a full survey um, which will be taking place prior to, to the cattle, cattle going on. Uh, we have some historic surveys, but we will be updating those through um, a full NBC survey of the, the site uh, to capture uh, the baseline um, before, the, before the cattle come on. Um, we'd be very, very lucky to have some input from, from, from uh, one of our volunteers um, who is, who's carried out um, a mycological survey of, of the site, and that certainly informs some of the decisions we've made, uh, particularly in terms of where we're going to place um, the, uh, the cattle troughs um, uh, and, and you know, in terms of the concentration of, of where the, the, the cattle will, will be uh, going. Um, and then, um, like, like Colin, we also have, we'll, we'll be using um, the uh, no fence collars, which will allow us to actually manage within the fenced area uh, the grazing regime as well. Um, so, you know, sort of from that uh, initial baseline survey, and then monitoring, and then also using the system science monitoring, which will uh, allow us through a variety of volunteers and also partnerships with things like the Field Studies Council um, and some of the schools and college groups that we have already using the, the site uh, for, for, for their research, um, we'll be able to have a really comprehensive monitoring of the impact of the interventions we're making. Thanks, Chris. Okay, so there's a few questions around um, the Rosa rugosa. Now, obviously, invasive species is quite a kind of controversial subject because, especially with something like Rosa rugosa, which is obviously good for birds as it stands. Actually, Colin, perhaps you could maybe answer this one because I think you've got Rosa rugosa on the Scottish site on the Merse Head as well. How do you kind of balance up the, the kind of bird interest and the other things that live on it as well with, um, you know, the, the fact of taking it out and then how do you replace it? Okay, uh, well, obviously, uh, the Japanese rose is an invasive species, and if we don't do something about it, the more natural species are going to be suppressed as a result. Uh, in the more mature dune areas, we we don't want it there because it's, you know, for a long time, it was, it was sort of, um, it was believed that scrub on dunes would help stabilise them. That's not the case. Um, so we will carry on removing um the japanese rose we actually through i i failed to mention it but in a, in our eu life uh, funding we will be taking on a, a, a program removing this rose um i saw there's another question there, you know conflicts with birding and this that and the other so f so for mare's head we have a you know a four kilometer trail we've deliberately left scrub in in areas for different types of species or pioneer scrub so for, for birds like grasshopper warblers for example up to more mature areas and um, the areas where we want to do the grazing really you know in Preston Mers really sort of you know is we would like the, the dunes to be the most natural they could be for species like natterjack toad for example we want to be able to manage the dune slacks we don't want scrub, um, scrub in those areas because an important species like natterjack toad aren't going to thrive there um, but we are trying to find a balance and actually you know looking at um making sure that scrub in the right in the right areas natural scrub in the right areas you know in, indigenous scrub uh, will be allowed to grow at various stages but not across the whole site great thank you um that, that's it from me but um, um yeah. i mean for mayor's head the, the japanese rose isn't is maybe not as be as dominant as it is with chris i'm not too sure um we haven't recently just mapped it all because we have to show what we're going to remove with the with the uh, eu life uh, funding but um it's not as intense as i thought it was going to be does anybody want to come in from the cumbrian side just to add to that yeah, I mean, certainly we we had the similar um, you know sort of debates and conflict in terms of you know getting the right balance in terms of scrub control uh, on Marlborough. Um, I was talking about you know sort of the the, the distinction really between the area which was um, used as landfill to the south of the site, um, and then you know the area which is really undisturbed and, and has the potential for you know really high quality dune heave. So yeah, in terms of in terms of our management approach, we wanted to balance. Um, the removal of of, of scrub. Um, I, I think the removal of, as I would entirely concur with Colin in terms of the uh, 
um, Rosa Rigosa, um, that, that, that needs to go. Um, but certainly in terms of gorse and scrub, um, we want to allow it to thrive in the southern part of the, the, the site um, to, to produce good bird habitat uh, and where the potential is to really restore the, um, the June heath. Uh, we will continue to, 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 to re remove and then with the cattle grazing uh, to, to try and suppress the, um, the, the, the continuing succession to, to gorse encroachment. Great. Thank you, Chris. Just add into the Rosa Ragosa question, um, which there's quite a few questions on this. Um, Anna um, Lackey's uh, asked a question around um, what you think might recolonise um, the sort of scraped area when you remove the Rosa Ragosa um, and what the biodiversity benefits are. I think that some of that's been partly answered, but I don't know if anyone's got any ideas about anything that kind of might benefit from those bearer patches. Um, um, yeah. Oh, oh, go on. Sorry. <laughs> go on, Colin. No, go on. Um, I, I think I, I think I think all three of us have touched on this, you know, pioneer species mm. and everything like this across the dunes. So poaching from grazing, poaching, uh, uh, removal of scrub and areas are going to leave lovely bare patches, which is going to be invaluable for um, um, early floral stuff coming through and inverts in particular. Um, down to solitary bees, mining bees, all sorts of things like that. So um, it's about monitoring going back. It's, it's not just like going back, like um, Chris was saying about going back and retreating areas, but you're not going to go back and not retreat without monitoring to see, see the effects of the work we're doing. Um, so there needs to be a legacy. That's what I'm saying is you need to go back and see what's happening. Um, and yeah, just trying to produce... You know, habitat management, it's always a, you're always a, it's always a bit of a battle. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Do you want to add something to that, Eve? You yeah, yeah, up? just to add to that, I mean, uh, you kind of expect like sea holly and things like that to colonise that area, which like particular particular types of bees actually go to to feed off. Um, but as part of the citizen science scheme at um, Marbury Banks, I, I've noticed I say, I say that wrong now with my Barovian accent, um, but we will be setting up like fixed quadrats of, uh, along these particular points where the Rosa Ragosa has been removed to monitor the vegetation. And if the Rosa Ragosa comes back, maybe, you know, so we can understand what exactly what impact it's having on those particular areas that's great thank you for that eve that's great so there's a, I'll, I'll combine a couple of questions because we're kind of running out of time and um, but either eve or chris i think this one's for is um how long do the butyl liners last and how do you fill the ponds up do they fill up naturally with rainwater or do you have to fill them up <laughs> I yeah. I, the the butyl, butyl liners um you know, sort of have a 20 year guarantee um but because they're covered you know, the, the main the main threat to a butyl liner is is actually uv damage and because actually um we we we, we reburied them uh, under a layer of sand um you know i i think we can expect you know sort of a I don't know. I'm probably guessing, but you know, sort of <laughs> pretty much an indefinite life lifespan for for the liners because actually they're they're not subject to deterioration from anything but 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 UV damage. Um, and you know, the pools have refilled um, you know, and actually through through rain rain rainfall. And as I say, they will dry out periodically during the summer and then refill. Um, and uh, Certainly, we found in the, the first time we we, uh, we we put the the new pools in, um, we put them in, and really unusually for uh, <laughs> for, for Cumbria, uh, it then didn't rain, and we sort of have had this issue in terms of you know sort of the early part of the year um, being dry for for the last couple of years unusually, um, so um, you wouldn't want to fill them with um, you know sort of. Uh, uh, tap water um, completely but certainly the advice from uh, amphibian reptile conservation is that actually just topping them up for the first spawning so if we do have the situation where actually you know sort of in April May we have a dry period and the pools uh, aren't full uh, then we probably will now we have actually have water on site for the um, for, for, the, for the grazing um, we may well top them up uh, to enable that first spawning to get away um, and then, you know, sort of uh, 
they, they, they may well then dry out later on. Uh, we wouldn't intervene at that stage. So as long as we're topping up rather than actually refilling, um, you know, sort of uh, tap water uh, can actually enable us to, to get that first, first spawning um, away if we do have a dry period early in the, in the year. Um, again, it's one thing we'll be experimenting with and, um, you know, sort of uh, and monitoring uh, the success of that. Thank you. Uh, we've got two or three questions around the same topic of access here, so I'll just sort of run them in together. And again, the focus on Marlborough Banks, Chris, I'm sorry you're working a bit hard here with the questions. Um, and I think it's just a question, will there still be public access to Marlborough Dunes? Um, I think there's obviously quite a lot of changes at Marlborough recently, so obviously there's a lot more questions. Um, and a little another question about how hard was it to get the fencing, public consultation, dog walkers and funding together? So it's a twofold question really about, first about what the access still will be and then sort of what the process we went through to, to do some of the fencing and consultation and all of that. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's been a difficult year in terms of um, you know, public engagement. Eve and I had all sorts of plans as to, to what, what we would have been doing on the, the run up to the major interventions on, on Marlborough Banks. Um, and that has been curtailed as have many other things by, 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 by the, the COVID-19 situation. Um, but you know, one of the key things in terms of getting the fencing right uh, was making sure that we were allowing access for where people wanted to go. We didn't want we wanted to to respect people's desire lines across the across the reserve uh, and access you know onto and off the reserve. So you know, sort of quite a significant uh, cost element in terms of putting the fence in, um, but also in terms of um, you know sort of the planning for it and the consultation. I spent quite a bit of time throughout you know sort of certainly over the summer as as lockdown was eased. Uh, talking to people, but also observing where people went and and how they moved around the reserve to make sure that we get uh, gates in um, that respect where where people want to access. So we have a lot of gates in in in, in the fence, um, um, and uh, we've made sure that those are all the kissing gates are are big enough for people to be able to get buggies through and so on. And um, we've um, although we've removed one boardwalk uh, which had failed and was collapsed, but the the boardwalk along the actual um, the shoreline on the the raised beach uh, that will uh, continue to be accessible for 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 those um, with mobility problems and um, uh, wheelchair access. Um, so, um, yeah, what, what I what I did over the summer was was talk to people on site. I was on site a, site a great deal, doing quite a bit of preparation work for for the work going on, uh, and and finding out where people wanted to go, how they used the dunes, and then. Probably more important in some ways, actually just observing and uh, you know seeing seeing how people moved across the dunes and made sure we got the uh, got the gates in the right place. Well, and then some of that again, you know, again through the uh, COVID nineteen situation, really, um, you know, we've we've been very active both through social media. We've set up our own uh, special website for for the project, so we've tried to keep information flowing on what we're doing, why we're doing it, responding to questions. Um, and uh, you know, sort of, hopefully, bringing people largely with us. It will be different, and you know, and as I said, you know, I I I, I love Marlborough. Um, I have a dog. Um, I walk on 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 there all the time, um, uh, and it will be different having the cattle on there. But what we try to do is minimise that impact and respect um, how people how people use the area. That's great. I'm afraid we've kind of run out of time. So there was quite a few more questions, but we really don't have time to kind of go into them. But perhaps we can try and, you know, have a look at them afterwards and answer any that we've not been able to and, and post them, you know, for uh, everybody to see. So it just leaves me to um, thank the speakers, uh, Eve, Colin and Chris. That was really great and really kind of learned quite a lot there. Um, and I hope everyone, everybody enjoyed the talk. I'll just pass over to Naomi for a final few words. Yeah, just to say we'd really like your feedback and um, we haven't done um, our events on a webinar function before until um, obviously the um, autumn last year. Um, so we're always keen to get some feedback um, and some ideas for future sessions as well. Um, you can um, reply to the email address that you got through your link, um, those of you who've um, signed up for this um, through Eventbrite, um, but you can also post your um, comments on the info at Solway Coast A1B page as well, or use our social media channels. So on uh, both Solway Coast Partnership and the Solway Coast are on Facebook and Twitter. And um, uh, we actually, at our next cross-border coastal conversation session um, will be on the 22nd of April, um, and it's called How Rocks Shape the Solway Coast. So um, we're looking forward to hearing a bit more about geology. So a new um, 
new area um, for some of these talks, which will be an interesting one. So um, just thank you very much for joining us and really good to hear all of your comments and your questions and such a global um, audience as well. It's been great. So um, we hope you've enjoyed it and we look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>